Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to another Nento Tuesday. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, varieties of crops, potential crops that you might consider growing in the Nento jacket. Uh, we've got Bob, Glenna, and Phil with the Cooperative Extension Service. Um, I worked with these folks for several years, Bob and, and Phil longer than Glenna, but she, she definitely knows her stuff. And in fact, she's going to kick us off today and talk about some research at the UAF uh, uh, farm. Glenna Gannon, please. Thanks, Mo. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and then we will take it away. All righty. Hopefully everyone can see this. So yeah, as uh, Eric said, my name is Glenna Gannon. I'm an assistant professor of sustainable food systems. And I also direct the vegetable uh, variety trials at the agriculture and forestry experiment stations. And that's largely what I'll be talking about today. But first I wanna just get us uh, started with a little bit of housekeeping. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of different crops today and using some terminology that might not be super familiar. Um, this little Venn diagram is just something to help you think about out, um, what we're saying when we say something like agronomic crops. So we're talking a lot about small grains. Um, some of these um, things like forage crops might include hay or animal forage. And then I'll be talking in this uh, first section a lot about vegetable and fruit um, crops. Um, so this just helps you uh, situate what it is we're talking about. These are all agricultural crops that can be grown in Alaska, but just with different classifications. All right, so to kick us off, I'm going to start with fruit and berry crops. I'm going to be going through this relatively quickly. There will be some varieties uh, named as well as resources for you to reference later, um, and my contact information will also be included again later. Um, so on this first slide, or on that first slide, those are has gaps, um, just for those who weren't sure. Um, so first talking about fruit trees, um, some different fruits that do grow in Alaska. Um, we have had successes at the Fairbanks Experiment Station, as well as the Palmer with several varieties of apples. Um, there was also a apple breeder here by the name of Claire Lammers, who um, bred some distinct varieties of his own. Um, there's also a lot of, there's a series of apples uh, that were bred in Saskatchewan um, called the, the Lander uh, apple ver series. So Parkland, Norland, um, those all do fairly well in our zone two areas. Um, we also have some uh, sweet, or excuse me, sour cherries, uh, some dwarf and sour cherry varieties that do well here in Alaska in the interior. Um, that includes Evans, which is what you see in that photo there in the center. Um, again, there's a romance series out of Saskatchewan uh, that of, of sour dwarf cherries that is also pretty successful here um, in the more uh, ideal parts of the Tananaw Valley. Um, so that includes Valentine, Romance, Carmen Jewel, etc. Um, there's been some experimentation with pears and plums um, that do all right. I would direct you to the Alaska Fruit Trees Project, which is down here in the resources. Um, they have a really robust list of all the different fruit trees that they have uh, trialed over the last uh, couple decades. Uh, you, uh, similarly, the UF Cooperative Extension Service and the Georgeson Botanical Garden have trialed a number of different um, uh, varieties of all of these different species uh, that you can check out. Um, and then I also just wanted to make a note that uh, high tunnels might be a really good option if your interest is in growing fruit and berry trees, um, as that just helps create a more um, beneficial uh, controlled environment for for fruit plants that can be more sensitive to the interior Alaska temperatures. A lot of these are considered, a lot of these varieties that I've mentioned are considered marginal to okay for an environment, but certainly would benefit from some uh, controlled environment conditions. All right, so moving on to berry crops. For annuals, we have strawberries. Um, there are also some strawberries that do well as perennials here, but not on a production scale. Uh, we also have uh, in the realm of domestic berries, um, a lot of success with different raspberry varieties, the Ribes genus that includes currants, gooseberries, josta berries, uh, hascaps, also known as honeyberries, um, which I mentioned in that first photo, do very well. They're of Siberian origin, so very hardy for this area. 
Um, Saskatoon berries or service berries are also quite hardy here, as are sea buckthorn and rhubarb, which is technically a vegetable, but gets classified in fruits. Um, and I put it in the berry slide, um, but that is also very hardy and has a lot of value add potential, um, a lot as, as do berries. So moving quickly into vegetable crops, like I said, I've been directing the variety trials for um, about five years now. However, variety trials, I'm getting ahead of myself here, so I'll talk a little bit about more about this in a few slides, but variety trials here at the Agriculture and Forestry Experiment Station um, have been ongoing for over 100 years. So what I'm going to be sharing is based on that um, and then some of the details more so on the research that I've done in the last uh, five years or so. So vegetable crops that do well for interior Alaska are coal, coal crops or um, brassicas such as cabbage, broccoli, kale, um, cauliflower are quite cool soil hardy. Um, and most are not particularly sensitive to our long photo periods. Uh, potatoes are also a very hardy and successful crop um, and have a lot of diversity in terms of the varieties you can grow as are um, the Amaranthiaceae family. So goosefoot, this is, includes our beets, Swiss chard, spinach. Um, this, this is another really good option uh, to the umbel fillers, the carrots, parsnips, celery, fennel, uh, legumes. So um, legumes are good crops, both for human consumption as well as for cover and forage crops. So building up your soil nutrition um, with nitrogen fixers and forage um, for animal feed. Um, we also do uh, really well with many leafy greens, such as lettuce and microgreens, um, mixed Asian greens for like baby, um, like baby spinach, or excuse me, baby salad blends uh, are quite tolerant of our cooler climate and short growing seasons, as are many cucurbits, so squash, pumpkin, zucchini. Um, so like I said, my slides, I feel like I got them out of order a little bit, but here's the two locations of the variety trials, um, the current variety trial sites in Alaska. There's been others throughout the decades, but these are the two active farms, one in Fairbanks and one in Palmer. Um, Nanana is just uh, 50, 60 miles south of the Fairbanks farm. So I'm mostly focusing on results from the Fairbanks station in this presentation. However, there are publications, um, as you, you see here, from both stations um, that demonstrate the results of the different crops that are grown in the trials uh, for each uh, station. So I'm going to just jump into a few examples. This is not, um, do not consider this a totally uh, robust and comprehensive uh, review of the results, but it's just to give you an idea of what these reports contain. Um, and I'm just going to mostly be looking at crops that I mentioned, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, are quite um, appropriate for interior Alaska's growing conditions. So um, here's an example of some of the beets. Um, this table in the upper left-hand corner is just taken directly out of one of those reports from a single year. So you can see the different varieties that we trialed, uh, the seed source, um, planting, um, design, and then a harvest period, as well as yield information, and some of the subjective ratings, including plant vigor, bolting sensitivity, pest resistance, disease resistance, and so on. Um, and so I won't like I said, go into these too deeply, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of data that we've collected on, on many varieties over the years. And then here you can also see in the lower right-hand corner um, some uh, consolidated data from uh, five years of growing. So you see with beets, there's not a whole lot of difference in yield. There's a few varieties that rise to the top in terms of yield, um, such as Zeppo, Robin, Sabeto. They significantly outperformed the others, whereas you see varieties like Early Wonder had really high variability in their yields um, and would be, for example, one that we don't recommend as a um, particularly reliable variety for Alaska. So that's the kind of information that we are um, consolidating here with these reports after several years of, of trialing. Um, similarly with carrots, not a lot of difference in yield across varieties over a number of years. Um, you will notice in the summary here, it says 11 variety tri varieties trialed for five years. So when you see this graph here in the lower um, right, that's actually just looking at varieties that we have long-term data for. However, many more than uh, these 11 have been trialed um, more recently. Uh, 
And then we also have information on storage ability and taste tests as well. So having some um, important information for, for potential markets and um, consumers there. Winter squash, like I said, cucurbits are um, a good crop here in interior Alaska, some more so than others. So this is just winter squash. Um, and we've only started including winter squash in our trials uh, in the last couple of years. So we don't have long-term data just yet, but we are seeing some really positive results um, up here in interior Alaska where our growing degree days or um, the, the overall heat of our growing season is a little bit higher than down uh, in the Matsu, the more um, uh, coastal areas. All right, um, so here's an example of uh, other crops that we trial that I didn't include in the recommended for interior Alaska list because they're still considered somewhat marginal. So you can see if you look at the graph over the long-term data, there's a lot more variability. Um, we have uh, some varieties, for example, with corn that we would recommend and others that um, we definitely wouldn't. However, I still wouldn't necessarily call this a you know viable crop. This might be something that you include in a um, you know multi um, in in a yeah multi species or intercropping design on a farm. But I wouldn't necessarily uh, recommend that anyone go forth and be a corn farmer in Interior Alaska just yet. Uh, potatoes is another crop that I mentioned earlier that is highly viable for interior Alaska. There's many opportunities for specialty crop, both as an eating and seed potato production, um, and potentially for export market. This is something that in Alaska's history has been talked about a lot. Um, and then certainly uh, there's a need for certified seed potato um, production here in Alaska as we don't want to introduce new pathogens or pests to our soils since we're relatively um, pathogen and disease free here in Alaska. We want to keep it that way for um, you know, our growing conditions as well as for future generations. The Alaska Plant Material Center has a lot of really great information on the um, certified disease-free potato program, um, as well as is a source of uh, seed potatoes, clean seed potatoes, I should say. And again, here's just some um, images of both a potato production there in the center here in Alaska, a rather large scale potato production. Um, some of the different varieties when we think about specialty crops that can be grown in Alaska with that colorful photo, and then a extension publication um, that may be of use to some of you as a, as a resource. Um, I'm not going to dive into floriculture too much. I added this uh, last minute, but this is just another um, crop type that um, folks might want to consider as something that can be grown in Alaska. There's been a pretty large growth in cut flowers um, in all over the state of Alaska, and there are some resources out there. So it's just another option. And then there's also some native species that grow in Alaska that folks may want to include as part of their farm plan. Um, so your whole farm might not revolve around these species, but certainly if you're looking at more of an agroecology or a permaculture design, uh, why, there are many wild berries that grow in the region, including raspberries, lingonberries, currants. Um, there's also other uh, leafy greens and plants that have high nutritional or vitamin content. And of course, there are fungi um, caveat, making sure that folks um, either can correctly identify or are um, inoculating the selecting for the fungi that they want to harvest um, for uh, commercial sale. And then chaga is a fruiting body that occurs on birch trees that may be something um, that folks can inoculate birch trees with. So just something to keep in mind. So here are a couple of resources. Again, I'm going through these really fast because I want to get to our other presenters today. Um, so Plant Materials Center, here's their website. Uh, you can see there on the left-hand side, there's a nice uh, menu of the different types of programs that they have information on and work on. Uh, as I mentioned, we are with the Agriculture and Forestry Experiment Station, Bob and myself, and here are the websites for getting more information on the agricultural research that's been done over the years at the AFES stations. There's also the Matanuska Experiment Farm Extension Center's Facebook page. Uh, you can find that just by uh, Googling the MEFIC um, face on Facebook. We also, we being Cooperative Extension Service, has a YouTube channel. Uh, myself and my colleague Heidi Rader have developed a number of short YouTube videos uh, talking about results from various years of varieties trials, as well as how to grow different crops. 
And we also have an Instagram page. Um, so like, for example, this is a post from earlier this summer. So we do keep people updated through social media on the different projects and results from trials that we have going on. So there is my contact information. I know I went through that very quickly, but the good news is this is being recorded. So you can always revisit it later. And I will stop share so that Bob can talk to us about agronomic crops. Thank you, Glenna, and thanks for passing off to Bob. Bob D squared. Oh, hey, hopefully this works. You're looking good so far. Oh, yeah, everybody see that? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Mine's going to follow pretty much the same kind of format that Glenna just did. Um, we're going to talk about agronomic crops in this case, and that's going to be mostly large scale, although these can be scaled down to grow in your backyard if you want to. And again, kind of like the way Glenna had presented hers, we'll talk about those that do well best and those that are a little bit more marginal that might be able to be done. Uh, so well, the first thing that I always like to tell people if you're looking for an agronomic crop is to pick one that is suitable for Alaska. And there are different kinds of agronomic crops. Obviously, everybody's probably familiar with true cereal grains, which include barley, oats, wheat, rye, and triticale. And there are different types of each of these grains. For example, barley will be a two row or a six row, which identifies the number of seed kernels on a head. Um, you got to grow it for animal feed, there's hollis for people feed, there's malting barley and hooded forage. Um, oats will have both animal feed and hollis. Wheat will be hard red spring wheat, soft white pastry wheats, um, durum pasta wheats, and some of the ancient wheats like spelt and einkorn, and rye and triticale. Triticale is actually a man-made cross between wheat and rye. Um, there are also pseudo cereals, which are broadleaf plants that are treated like grain plants. Things like buckwheat, like you see in the photograph there, quinoa and amaranth. There are pulse crops, which are legumes, in this case, mostly dry field peas, mostly again for animal feed, and oil seeds, which include Polish canola, mustards, camelina, flax, and sunflowers. It, uh, Bob, Bob, uh, yeah. You're you're not uh i don't think your screen is sharing are we supposed to, we're not seeing any images we just see you still really yeah i got a lot of stuff showing up um hit the share screen in zoom first i thought i did that so oh, do yeah, you have sorry to interrupt you but yeah i i realized that you were talking about stuff on screen that was not being visible We will try this again. Yeah, perfect. There you go. Got it. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Through the agronomic crops, true cereal grain, pseudo cereals that I was talking about earlier, pulse crops, and oil seeds. Okay, there are two things that everybody should be focusing on, regardless of whether you're a large scale grower or a backyard gardener. The first one is quantity. Do you get harvest more than you plant? And so here to choose which varieties are going to be good, you want to pick those that are from a similar northern environment. Things like Alaska, northern US, Canada, Scandinavia, Russia, China are the ones that we all choose for varieties that we're working with. Um, I'll get more into the difficulties of getting grain varieties from foreign countries to Alaska a little later. Uh, you want to pick those that do well in high latitude. I've gotten an awful lot, a lot of questions saying that, well, I can grow this barley in the mountainous regions of Tibet, and that's very similar to Alaska. Well, summer sessions are not because summers in there are much colder than they are here in the interior of Alaska. So. Just because it does well high in elevation doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do high in latitude. Uh, you want to take a look at the various agronomic characteristics. Uniformity means that it's going to be all the same height and all at the same maturity at all the same time. You want to make sure you get something that doesn't fall over in the weather. 
resistance to lodging. You want something obviously that's going to be early maturing. And you want to be considering the photo period. Uh, if it needs a period of darkness to initiate flowering, then more than likely it's not going to do well in Alaska because that darkness isn't going to happen until August and you're not going to have enough time to get a ripe crop before September. You also have to take a look at the cultural practices. What do you need to grow a high quantity crop kind of fertility, irrigation, pest control, things of that sort, and whether or not you need any special machines or instrumentation to plant, harvest, thresh, and process. The other one is quality. Just because you can grow a high quantity of a crop doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a very high quality. For example, one of the things that we can grow a high quantity of is spring wheat, but it isn't very high quality every single year. So you have to take that into consideration. Is it going to be good enough for you to then turn into a product like flour? Um, you want to take a look at the uh, other things. For example, if you're going to do oil processing, how mature is it at harvest? How ripe is it? If it's not mature and it's not ripe, it goes rancid really quickly. And rancid oil is absolutely horrible to cook with. Um, however, there are certain things like uh, if you don't get a high quality wheat in one year that you can probably blend it with wheat that does come from the lower 48 and still use your product to make a high quality uh, product. And of course, you have to look at the cost of production from planting all the way through processing. For example, if you're going to be doing oil seeds, there are no oil seed presses in the state of Alaska. So you're going to have to worry about getting one here and learning how to operate it. This is something else that I want to stress is you're going to be buying seed from anywhere that it has to be certified seed. You want to make sure that it's guaranteed quality. Don't go buying feed stuff because it's cheaper and bringing in noxious weeds or diseases that we don't necessarily need. Uh, the other issue is, of course, seed that's purchased from outside of the United States has to have a phytosanitary certificate and go through customs to get it here. And that takes time. So if you're interested in getting a barley variety from Finland, you should be you know, looking at that now so that by the time all the paperwork's filled out, it's done uh, by, before you plant. These are some of the varieties that we've developed in Alaska for production in Alaska by year and type. There's Trapmar Hull S Barley, and Hull S Barley is one that does not have a hole on the outside that is suitable for people. Bead Barley has a hole on the outside that is more suitable for ruminant animals like cattle. And if we wanted to eat feed barley, we'd have to get a de-hulling machine, which has increased your cost of production to take the hull off. We have a bunch of six row feed barleys that were developed in the 70s and 80s. And Sunshine Hollows Barley, which is down there in the bottom, is the barley that the Bryce Wrigley and his family use for the Alaska Flower Company and all their fine products. We've got three separate oats, a black oat, which is basically a black covering on the seed coat and yellow oats, which is more typical. These are all feed oats. Here again, you have to have the hull removed if people are going to eat these. So these are mostly for animal feed. We have three wheat varieties, Ingle, Noble, and Vidal, and a winter wheat called Bebril. Um, of all the hundreds and hundreds of wheat varieties that have been tested at the experiment station for over 100 years, Ingle is by far the earliest. Unfortunately, it has a very small seed and tends to head shatter. So that very first measurement that I talked about as far as quantity, this doesn't produce a very good quantity. Similarly, it doesn't necessarily produce a good quality every single year either. So this is one of the things you'd have to take a look at from uh, botanical descriptions of varieties when you wish to order anything. We also have Deltana open pollinated Polish canola and Midnight Sunflower, which is a dwarf open pollinated edible oilseed sunflower that were developed here. The canola can be planted and maintained and harvested with the same type of equipment that you do for grains. The sunflowers, though, are more of a horticultural crop. Uh, the plant biomass tends to remain high in moisture, and so it's very difficult to run through a plot combine or anything like that to harvest the entire heads. You're doing this more by hand. However, both of these varieties do reach a level of maturity, and both of them have value as bird seeds, especially. 
Some of the other things that we can grow that are testing and kind of like what uh, Glenna has talked about, these things are not necessarily as good as everything else like for Alaska. So if we use barley as our seed source, our, our quality, six row feed barley almost always grows to a good uh, quantity and quality every single year in Alaska. And everything else after that is gonna take just a little bit longer and might not necessarily reach quality standards every year. We have two row and six row feed barleys. We have forage barleys, which have hoods instead of the ons on there. So you can harvest the entire plant for forage if you need to. Uh, holus obviously, and malting barleys. Oats that we've tried are yellow, red, and obviously the first black one we had there and hull less. The hull less oats are the ones that obviously don't have holes that again, people can eat directly without any further processing other than grinding it up. Uh, we, we have hard red spring and winter. We've tried soft white spring and winter, which is more along the lines of what you would do for uh, cakes and cookies, things of that sort. Uh, we've tried durum, which is a pasta wheat, and some of the older, what's called ancient wheats, spelt and einkorn. One of the things that I want to point out is that almost all of the wheats uh, lose their hulls during harvest threshing and cleaning, but the ancient wheats do not. If you take a look at that photograph there in the lower right, you can see that there's hull left on the outside of the spelt wheat. So if you wish to grow that, you're going to have to worry about getting some instrumentation to remove the hull before you can grind that up for flour. Continuing on down with what makes a little bit less um, possibility of getting a good quality crop would be rye, uh, triticale, which is that cross between wheat and rye. Buckwheat, in this case, this is the seed of the buckwheat in the middle there, the dark holes, which have to be removed before you can use any of the flour on the inside. And this becomes, what do you do with the holes when you do remove them? Uh, so other than composting or something. Uh, quinoa we've tried in the past, uh, one of the things that we learned early on from the plant breeder that sent us the quinoa to test was that quinoa is open pollinated and in the exact same family as lamb's quarters. And so if you wanted to save seed and you didn't control your lamb's quarters, then you're going to have a little bit of everything after that. So who knows what comes up. Uh, field peas, most of these are green and yellow. Uh, the yellow ones do real well in Alaska and you can grow those anywhere. The biggest issue is what do you do with them? Uh, most of these are raised as an animal feed that you can process later. Uh, the biggest thing with field peas is that they're uh, very easy to breed. And so out there in the market, there are probably thousands of different varieties and just about any of the yellow ones will do about the same quality. Uh, oil seeds, we've tried uh, Polish, obviously, which you saw pictures earlier, which has the yellow, brown, orange, uh, seed. Argentine is this more of a black, purple, reddish color one. Uh, Argentine types, if you ever bought canola oil in a grocery store, it's probably going to be an Argentine type because that's what most of the rest of the world grows. Unfortunately, in Alaska, I can get good quantity, but exceedingly poor quality. I've very rarely have ever gotten anything of less than 50% green seed at a harvest time for Argentine canola. Uh, we do grow mustards very well here. We have the condiment mustard, which is the yellow seed you see there, and the brown mustard, which is usually dried and ground into a powder. Oriental mustards are usually ground up as a mustard oil for cooking. Uh, mustards like uh, canola are brassicas, and brassicas do real well in the entire state of Alaska. The biggest issue with mustards is the biomass that you would have to deal with in harvesting. Canola maybe grows about two and a half, three feet tall, whereas mustards will grow around five to five and a half feet tall. So that's a lot of extra biomass to have to run through a combine. So we have to worry then about managing your biomass before you can harvest your, your, your seed. Uh, camelina is uh, another oil seed that does fairly well. Um, this is used mostly for um, salad dressings and things of that sort. And we've tried flax, both oil seed and fiber flax. Some of the grains that I have talked about earlier, the barley, oats, wheat, and, what, and rye, whatnot, can be obtained from the Plant Materials Center here in Palmer. 
Uh, they will sell you a 50 to 80 pound bag. So you'll be using one of those bags to plant an acre. So you think about how much area you've got and how much seed you're gonna want. They will not sell you anything less than a full bag. Uh, limited amounts of some of the other stuff can be obtained from Ming Chu Zhang, who's uh, the program leader for the agronomy research. He's in Fairbanks and that's his email there. Or if you wanted to get something from me, this is down here in the Matanuska Experiment Farm. That's my email there. Uh, here again, though, these are basically going to be free, but they're very small volumes. We might be able to give you a pound, and that'd be about it. There's nothing more that we can expend beyond that. And once we reach a certain limit, then that would be it, because we need this for our trials as well. Most of the grain that's put out these days since at least the late 1990s comes with plant protection rights or what's breeders rights. Uh, you can purchase seed as long as you process the harvest as feed or food. You are not allowed to save the seed to sell as either seed or use again without paying a penalty to the uh, company that owns the rights. Um, and of course, because of those rights, you're gonna have to pay an extra cost associated with that. And as we all mentioned before, down there at the bottom is the access to AFES research for all of these publications. They're free on the internet. Um, they go into a, a lot more detail on all the varieties that were tested at various places and the methods and means of growing them. So we talk about the fertility that's needed, the irrigation, pest management, the whole thing associated with that. So that's it for mine. Thank you, Bob. That was a, a great presentation. I, I learned several things in that as well. Um, Rounding us out today is Phil Caspari from Delta Junction. Uh, go ahead, Phil. I'm pulling up your slides, Phil, just a sec. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Good, good day, folks. And I'm gonna be leaning on Glenna here uh, to, so I'll, I'll just be asking her to advance things. So this is who I am, Phil Caspari, the Ag Agent with Cooperative Extension in Delta Junction. And I also have my contact information on my final slide. So next, please, Glenna. So the, uh, as, you, as you folks are making your plans and going through your clearing operations, chances are you're, you're gonna be thinking more in terms of doing some annual cropping if you get into the agronomic side of things. A lot of you may be seriously considering forage production as compared to really gearing up and doing uh, cereal grains or, or some of the other grain crops that Bob just mentioned. And th there's definitely some opportunities in the forage market, but for those first few years as you're developing your, your farmstead, you've got roots and whatnot to be dealing with and just smoothing out that acreage, so you may well be thinking in terms of, of annual forages. And Bob did a good job talking through some of those varietal differences. And many of the varieties that we've been using up here for annual forages come out of the Peace River Valley of Alberta, British Columbia. So depending on what's available is kind of what we end up with. But for a, a two row smooth on, forage variety that that maverick that cdc maverick is is a barley variety that we've been using around delta here from time to time and then for a six row smooth on feed uh, although it's a feed slash forage varieties is ac ranger so those are a couple that you might want to think of for the vo uh, oats ac mustang is one that we've had around here again coming out of canada as well as that derby and triticale, this was, we, we haven't used this as often around here, but the pasture is uh, is one that has come up. And there's lots of different pea, cereal grain. Bob made mention about how well peas can grow around here. And, and if you're gonna do them as a forage, then it, it, it helps if you've got a cereal grain seeded along with those peas to give them something to stand up on and make the, 
the mowing harvesting process easier. But this is something, and Bob did a good job talking about, uh, um, you know, just understanding your market and and you know the, the some of the challenges of the harvesting and and where you're going to be going with this. So with, with these annual forages, they typically are are more difficult to get dried down into. A, a good dry hay package. So chances are you're going to be putting them up as a high moisture feed, which presents problems for, for marketing. Uh, you're wrapping them. Uh, you're hauling a lot of water. It makes a lot more sense if you've got local livestock for that. So thank you, Glenna. Yeah, on to the next one. So, so once you get past that stage and you feel like you're in a position to start investing in perennial grasses and, and establishing either pastures and or hay acreages. There's a lot of different species out there, <clears throat> but uh, you know, for the more typical ones still being used, there hasn't been a whole lot of research, uh, uh, forage variety trial work done for, for quite a few years in Alaska now. Uh, but I don't know that anything has really changed. Uh, so, so these are some of the, four more typical ones. The smooth broom is our standard for, for haying. It can be used in a pasture situation, but you have to be super conscientious about not putting a lot of pressure, grazing pressure on that, that acreage. So you would need to be rotating. And Timothy, and if you look down through this, when it talks about recovery rate there kind of down towards the, the bottom of that chart slow yeah timothy in the interior is a one cut cut option it does not tolerate grazing well at all you'll you'll kill it out if you put any kind of pressure on it but it's a real good one if you've got wetter ground and it'll yield very well on those wetter soils and it can tend to be a little bit easier to get into a nice dry baled hay package as compared to, to brome. And then the fescue and the Kentucky bluegrass are more of your, your pasture grasses, the, the bluegrass being the preferred one from a palatability perspective. And you, and you certainly can hay those. They're not as easy to, to hay. Uh, just because all of that leaf is right down towards the base of the plant, but they do recover real well. And that's why they are better suited for, for pasture. They've got that growing point right down at the, at the soil surface, at the, at the crown of the plant, and they can tolerate grazing. Um, so then at the bottom, there's some current Prices, uh, well, I mean, I say current, these were 2022 prices out of Alaska Garden and Pet, as I've got mentioned there. And in visiting with Alaska Garden and Pet, they, they, they're pretty certain that these prices are going to come down a little bit here in the coming year. But I'll just emphasize at this point that whatever you plan to do with your, your farming enterprise, Boy, start start sourcing your your seeds, your fertilizers, and stuff real early. We're still working through some of these transportation challenges. You know, post COVID here, there's there, yeah, there, there's plenty of challenges here. Uh, and I'll maybe highlight a couple other examples as we go. But next one, please, Glenna. <clears throat> and then seeding rates. I mean, the the big thing to to note is that yeah there's there's different sizes densities to these seeds but the pounds per acre and this is based on using a drill so smooth brown grass at 12 pounds per acre where the others are, are six pounds per acre through a drill if you decided to broadcast this my recommendation would be that you double those rates and with that statement on the bottom you know if if, if you can afford because none of this is inexpensive when you start doing acreage. But if you can afford to put more on, you're all that better off just to uh, 
help get a real good competitive stand up and going. Next one, go on, please. And yeah, I don't know, Glenna, can you move our, our, the window with us over so I can see those prices? I'm, I'm sorry, I maybe should have printed some of this PowerPoint off. Um, and it, it doesn't matter too much. I, I've got all of my, my uh, prices covered up here with-, with I, uh, I can read them for you, but if you like, Bob, which one? Uh... Phil, well, I think it, it, it doesn't matter. Folks will be able to see this. And I just wanted to, to get the point out to folks that there isn't anything inexpensive when you, when you start working through this. Um, and, I, and I'll show you in the next slide how we kind of calculate out some of these costs. But, but the fertilizer, this is 2022 Alaska Farmers Co-op. So, so that's here in Delta Junction. And, and again, if you're, if you're thinking acres worth of fertilizer needs, then please be contacting your, your fertilizer sources. These guys have to order, they're, they're starting, to, starting to place orders now. And if there's a big fluctuation in acres being planted, then it's gonna upset things a little bit. So, so start communicating early. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, yeah, then just kind of working on down through here. You, you folks can figure that out themselves. That oats as a companion crop there at 30 pounds, uh, it, it, it's a good idea to put some kind of a companion crop in when you're, when you're planting a perennial grass seed. This $1,150 per ton, that was Canadian certified number one oats that was brought in this last spring. Uh, really expensive. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that there might be opportunities to, to, to get a, a seed industry going here in Alaska for some of these. And there, there is some grass seed being grown up here. And, and a lot of the farmers in the right year, they'll save back some seed. But to, to, to get some high value certified seed going in the state, would, 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 there's, there's possibly opportunities there. And then that thousand pound yield is based on taking those oats off of, of that first year and the price around Delta for forage oats this year is like 360 a ton. So that's where I came up with that $180 as a possible return on your investment. And, and I don't think these numbers are too far off. I just went through an exercise with another individual here recently who was going to have to be reclaiming some acreage here, um, cleaning up some range land, pasture, and we came up with over $600 per acre, but he was going to have to do some heavy tillage, which you guys are gonna to have to do. I didn't figure any of that in here, but you'd hopefully be spreading this out over time. So next one, please, Glenna. So, so this is online, this Iowa farm custom rates. And for quite a few years, the USDA farm service agent down the hall from me as well as the Soil and Water Conservation District folks that are in the same building that I'm in, we have used these high range numbers, the figures there, times 25%, and you know, adding those together to, to come up with an Alaska rate. And we, we feel like that's pretty close when you start thinking in terms of your replacement costs, repair and maintenance, and so on and so forth. So that's what that's about. That's online. Next one, please, Glenna. So, you know, Mo had in his request that we talk a little bit about sustainability. Bob talked about knowing your market. Um, if you can keep your ground clean, you're way ahead of a lot of us out, out, out here that have been at this for quite a few years and have made some mistakes, you know, or just mother nature being what it is. So, so keep your ground clean. This Certified noxious weed free forage and, and gravel, or excuse me, straw, yeah, and gravel, but you're not going to be mining gravel off of your places for sale. But 
but but there's some opportunities here and it's been primarily straw going into the dog races on federal lands like DLM lands but there has been some certified hay that has gone for these woods bison release programs so that's something to keep in mind if you've got good clean acreage next one's please uh and from a, a delta crop improvement situation we were struggling with some noxious weeds here primarily wild oats so we geared up here a few years ago with some fairly sophisticated seed cleaning equipment and yeah bob stressed this certified seed you know everything that's coming on to your farm if, if you should be very conscientious about sanitation on on your farm and and like i mentioned earlier i i think the additional growing degree days in Ninana could possibly provide for some some opportunities for seed production if you're on limited acres you want a little higher value crop maybe think in terms of seed production but it takes a it takes some additional infrastructure to get to get to that point but if you're growing grain there and it's coming over to delta um think about the fact that we've got this seed cleaning equipment kind of sorta and I'll talk about that here <laughs> because it's we've had it about uh, this is would be our fourth spring going into this year but the roof on this this warehouse here where that equipment was set up um collapsed in in last winter storms so go ahead Glenna you can change so we, so we weren't able to use it at all last year but this is a little bit of a trial and it, I don't see that the whole thing came up on that slide which is kind of weird hmm, I'm not sure what okay there th thank you thank you Glenna so this it, it's when everything is tuned in real well you can look at those numbers and 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 see that that equipment works real well we got it primarily to be able to take wild oats out of tame oats and there's a piece of equipment in there that uses electronic photo cells to be able to accomplish that and it does a good job when everything is is to, tuned in just right next one please Elena. yeah and I I just took this picture yesterday I, I was at the co-op and uh, this is another example and lots of us have gone through this just the supply chain challenges post-covid but after that warehouse collapsed uh and they got an insurance claim and they ordered a another building and gosh it didn't show up until really late here so so they're just working away at uh, getting that warehouse back up and hopefully we will have that seed cleaning equipment going for this spring we i'll i'll admit we we saw problems this spring not having that stuff functioning for this this last growing season um, and that's just one shot of our co-op go ahead next one Glenna uh, we've got storage there for about 8,000 tons of grain this is a shot of the fertilizer tower here uh, next one please Glenna and an aerial shot that, that white building is the fertilizer plant and then the grain storage behind it. and that red building between them is the one that collapsed here this last winter um, it's about 15 miles for those of you that aren't aren't familiar with where it is about 15 miles outside of delta to the east northeast next one please Glenna. yeah and then be thinking if, you, if you're going to be focusing on on forage be thinking about yeah, your market again and different means of of uh, harvesting stuff sometimes we have those piddly august and September can be real difficult to get up dry hay so being able to put a palage is is a good option next one please Glenna and yeah I mean this is a dated slide but guys around here that that started getting into these heavy duty balers for putting up haylage it's not uncommon to have to do that in the snow next one please Glenna but just because it's it's cold out doesn't mean that you can get away without having a wrap up wrap it you do otherwise it'll start to spoil on you so bear that in mind you have to get yourself geared up with either one of those two blind wrappers or a single bale wrapper this happens to be a single bale wrapper here the next one and yeah I just threw this in here again sustainability consider fencing 
Um, I mean, this is a major issue. It's an ongoing issue in the Delta area. I heard earlier this winter that Fish and Game has intentions of releasing woods bison in the Mental Flats area. So over time, think about that. Yeah, F fencing your place. Next one, Glenna. Yeah, some of the resources. I, I, I highly encourage you to, to get to know your agents, get yourself involved, possibly join the Farm Bureau join your soil and water conservation district, uh, get involved, build community. That, that's going to be important as, as you develop your, your farmstead there. Uh, next one, Glenna. I think that's it. Yeah, and that's it. These last two slides with the draft horses are from down in the, the Dry Creek community. So, thank you. Well, uh, thank you for presenting today, uh, Phil and, and Bob and Glenna. Uh, this is some great information. I like that you guys mentioned several times uh, keeping weeds out of the project area. I think, or I'm hoping that everybody for Nanana Tolchakit is uh, trying to, to work with that and use that, the fact that it is weed free. You know, it's pretty, it's pristine. Um, so you're organic on day one. Uh, we, we just need to really try to keep it that way for, for marketing, just and not making your neighbors mad. You know, it only takes one person to bring in, you know, a, a pest problem, and then everybody's going to be mad at you, and nobody wants that. Uh, fencing for, for livestock is definitely critical. Um, somebody just yesterday, one of the owners was asking me about easements. Uh, on section lines, it's basically 50 feet on, you know, your side of, of the, the section line that you would need to to bring your fence back uh, along some of the roads. Those are all listed in the plats, uh, but it seems to be, uh, I think a hundred feet for Moe's Road. So that's 50 feet on your side of the center line. Uh, Kohlrabi Court and Rush, I believe are 60 foot. So you'd have to come back 30 feet. There is no easement between parcels. So where it was uh, brushed, uh, you know, please don't put it right in the middle of that trail, but you know, just on your side, uh, you should be good to go. Uh, I would encourage you to always talk to your neighbor about fencing, you know, just to let them know you're putting it in, see if they're putting it in. Maybe you guys could, you know, have a joint fence somehow. You can figure that out. Uh, but but fencing is critically important. Uh, as, as Phil was mentioning, there was, I've heard talk too about Minto Flats. I've not seen anything in writing, but I've heard it several, several times that they're looking at that, that potential. Uh, one of the things I was thinking long-term for the for this project area was making or you know you as a community would be the ones to do this but you could form a controlled livestock district that has some higher uh, responsibilities placed on livestock owners so if there's uh, animals livestock running within the project area you've got more of an ability to to deal with those issues whereas state law just says the owner of the the livestock is responsible for any damages it causes um, which is, doesn't really help a, a lot of people because it just, anyway, um, thank everybody. Thank you everybody for presenting today. Yep, yep, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna make a little comment, not to not to pick on Bob. Um, he, he made mention of NIP, the, the black oats, which is a great variety. It, it really is well adapted and yields quite well for us. But think in terms of what Bob mentioned in terms of uh, quantity. If, if you're going to be growing that crop in a quantity where you don't have storage on farm, the Alaska Farmers Co-op does not appreciate that variety because it's, it, it looks too much like wild oats. So they may actually refuse that, that particular variety. So think about some other varieties maybe. I just, that, that popped into my head and anyway. Another, another good reason to develop those relationships with, with your uh, local extension agents and folks who are in the know. Um, I hope that that is one big takeaway message in terms of the, you know, sustainability and protect, productivity of any future farming endeavor here is um, it's a, you know, fairly nascent agricultural scene here, but there has been a lot of work done and um, the people who are working like the gentleman presenting with me here today, um, myself, some of the other people have been mentioned today, you know, they're, they're very knowledgeable. Um, so really reaching out to those resources that do exist within the state is uh, a first best step in making sure that your farm is productive and sustainable. 
Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Bob, any final closing thoughts before we end today? Just want to give you another opportunity. No, not really, other than, you know, just reiterate uh, to make sure you know what you're growing a crop for. Um, you know, if you have a big old huge pile of canola sitting around in no processing facility, not going to do anybody any good. So just make sure that you scope everything out and do your homework before you buy seed. And, and we do have a, I think it's a one ton per hour press in Delta. Not a big one, but there is a little one here. Um, something to keep in mind. Okay. Otherwise, thank you, Bob, for and Glenna, for good presentations. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, John, I think that is uh, Nento Tuesday for this week. I believe we aren't uh, meeting again until January. I'll have to look at my schedule. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, the schedule I, I had out earlier is what we are still following. So, uh, have a good day and thank you for joining us and we will see you next time.